when we talk about assessment and how we actually get kids excited about writing, about learning, do we do it in a way that actually lifts our students up, that actually helps our students find their voice, you know, find their passions and, and share it with the world? In this conversation with Star Saxton, she gives so many great ideas on really rethinking assessment, doing it in a way that really honors our students, brings them in to the way that we teach. And I, I really love having this conversation with Star because I learned a ton about, you know, the practice she does in her own writing and how she's inspired educators across the world. I found out some really interesting um, interests that she has. And we talked about some things that we're interested in online, uh, that we're interested on uh, when we connect online. And so I know you're going to really love this conversation. It gives a lot of great ideas, really rethinking how we do assessment in our classrooms. Uh, her, her, her new book is coming out right away at the time of this podcast, and you're going to see a link below. So check it out. But I hope you enjoy this conversation with Star Saxine on the Innovators Mindset Podcast. All right. I am really pumped to have Star Saxton on the podcast today. Star and I have been talking a little bit this afternoon and she is just an amazing educator. She's a very prolific writer, which is kind of intimidating me, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that journey and um, really forward thinking. And we have met a couple of times. We talked about this. But weirdly enough, when I, when I, uh, we were talking before the podcast and I asked her, I'm like, have we actually met in person? And she said, yeah. And then, you know, I, it's so weird for me because I've known it, it's kind of this internet culture thing where I just feel like I've just known you, but I don't know if I've met you because you're just so ingrained into my world because I've always read your stuff. I've always looked up, up to you and I've always like appreciated how you, you push people um, in their learning, but in a way where it's like you, people, you got their back. You're not like yelling at people and making them feel crappy, but you're trying to guide them through that practice, which I think is really, you know, in, in a way that you do with writing. And I think that, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this, the way you write exemplifies really great teaching, right? Like you challenge people's ideas, you get them think you, they, they feel supported through that process, even they're kind of going through this. And so we're going to talk a little bit about your writing. I'm like really excited to hear about you, talk about your practice. But Star, thank you, first of all, for being on the podcast and taking time out of your day and just sitting. And I, I like love doing this. This is one of my favorite things about the pandemic, to be honest with you, is I just be able to like sit and like hang out and talk to people. So just, you know, you're a very accomplished writer, very accomplished educator. Can you tell people a little bit about your career path and what, how you got to what you're doing today? Sure. So what I was saying before we got started, which is kind of funny, like when I was in high school, I, I was definitely always a writer. Mm -hmm. I wrote for the school newspaper and I did keep a journal and I walked around all the time. And then I, I, I had done music journalism for a little bit and really enjoyed going to see live music and writing about the live music that I was seeing. And from there, you know, I, I never thought I was going to be a teacher. I right. had, you know, I, my degrees in British and American literature with a minor in writing. I really thought that with that major, you know, I wanted to write. That's really mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. And I, I kind of rejected teaching for a long time, even though everyone in my family says they knew that that's mm -hmm. what I was always kind of meant to be. And when I started teaching, I was like, this is what I'm meant to do. Like, I kind of knew right away. I mean, after the first six months of doubting it every single day that I made the right choice to go into teaching, because I cried a lot in the beginning, <laughs> um, just trying to do yeah. it. And like, I always felt like I wasn't serving my kids enough. And, you know, what can I do to be better? And um, the more I taught and the, I was very able to connect with kids very quickly at the high school level that I was mm -hmm. teaching, aside from being young, also, I just, kids were drawn to me. I was drawn to them. Mm -hmm. I was really, I, I don't know. I just wanted to know about them. I wanted to help them. I wanted to make their dreams a reality. I wanted to help them get there. And even when I didn't have the content knowledge as a teacher yet to do those things, I could connect with them on mm -hmm. a real human level. And I think that that was always kind of one of my strengths. And once I started teaching for a bit and started getting my sea legs about me and I moved on to my second school on Long Island, um, which was an affluent school. It was the complete mm -hmm. opposite of the school that I started in. Um, 
it was a lot like the school I grew up in mm -hmm. and I hated it. I hated working in an affluent um, public school on Long Island because I had to do things their way. And I was never very good at that. Mm -hmm. I was never very good at following the script. Um, that's, yeah. It's kind of like you, you tell me to do it and just because right. you told me yeah. to do it. Like um, obviously you don't, you don't follow it because you like writing it. Right. Like that's, that's kind of yeah, how I you mean, are. Right? I guess. I yeah. mean, I, I feel like you can't make decisions until you know the folks you're with mm -hmm. a lot of the times and right. a lot of the, like they have to dictate, um, the pace, the content, even though there are standards and skills we need to teach, there's so much wiggle room, especially in an English classroom, which is why I love it so much. Yeah. That idea of helping kids develop their writing voice was something that became huge in my learning space. And I started blogging, which was what I was doing before I even wrote the first book. Mm -hmm. And I remember like after I had starsaxing.com, my first, my first blog, I would check the analytics every day and it would be like three people today, three people read my blog right. today. And I would be freaking so off, <laughs> like be so excited yeah. that, you know, not even realizing that it was probably like two of the three clicks was me <laughs> looking check to see that works. if anybody else had <laughs> read the blog. Right. Um, and then you know, like I was doing some research for my first book about the myths of the beginning teaching, like first five years of teaching. And in that, I started getting onto Twitter mm -hmm. for the first time and joining chats and trying to kind of crowdsource some information using my journalism background, sort of trying to pull people in and get information about the fears new pre-service teachers had about going into teaching and what those misconceptions really were. And I had just cleared the first five years or mm -hmm. so I was maybe in my sixth or seventh year at that time. And I was like, somebody needs to be honest. When you go to your pre-service teacher education program, no one's honest with you about what's really happening in the classroom. Someone's got, someone's got to yeah. be honest about that. Well, well, it's funny when you're saying this, um, just kind of like you said about the importance of like knowing kids, right? And how, mm -hmm. so my perception at the beginning of my career when I taught, when I thought about education and who I thought were like really good teachers, right? Right. Who I thought were really good teachers were the teachers that would go into the school about two weeks early. They would overtake the photocopying machine. They would have all their photocopies done for the entire year. And if you ask them, hey, what are you doing? And you could ask this on any day. Hey, what are you doing October 12th at 10.30 a.m. in class? And they could tell you. They could say, this is what we're doing that day. Right? I was that person. Right. And they, they would say this. Like, the kids haven't even shown up to school yet. And they would kind of, like, get to that process, right? And their mentality uh, at the time was, I'm going to get kids to that space, right? I'm, like, they're mm -hmm. going to get there whether uh, whether they like it or not, Right. And what I started to realize as I, as I grew, uh, you know, in my, is that really great teachers, first of all, get to know their kids and they understand like, cause your kids, what if they're ahead of it? What if they're behind it? Like, you know, and I've always challenged this idea of like, when teachers say, oh, I got to get through the curriculum, I'm like, well, you getting through the curriculum doesn't mean the kids understand it. It's like, you feel good about yourself, but you actually, that doesn't mean like you getting through the curriculum and kids actually getting through and understanding the curriculum are actually not the same timeline. I can get through, I can get through a curriculum really quick to get the kids to understand it is a different timeline. I wish it could be the same, but it's not right. And so I think that, that to me is, is really important. And what you said is that there, sometimes we are placed in those situations where and schools might be listening to this right now, teachers, where they like have to teach according to the class across the hall. And then we talk about personalized learning. I'm like, you're not even letting them like know their kids in their classroom, right? Like that's that to me is a struggle. I wanted to ask you something about this because like you're okay so i've been asked this question for and it's just like like from people outside I'm education myself. yeah you should be because I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are i've been asked this question a couple of times recently and kind of sarcastically i think it's like hey so you know that quote like teachers who you know who can't teach i'm like yeah i, I guess right and like we've all heard this before 
And I was like kind of thrown off that this is that. I was like, do you believe that? I'm like, no. Like, and so like when I'm listening to you and talking to you, like, and I was thinking about this, you, you are an amazing writer. You are a writer before you became a teacher. And I think to me, there's so many teachers that are really brilliant in their content area, love that stuff that they do. And they want to share and elevate people in that same area. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're failed at that too, but there is like a, there's a different way of being. So like, I've been thrown off. Like, I was like, really people say that in like, well, what are you gonna say next? And if you can't teach, teach with Zed, like, okay. So I know that joke. That's funny. Okay. So like, whatever, but like, what do you like in your career path? Do you kind of totally debunk that notion? Right. Like, am I off there or what? No, no. I was going to say, I think that quote should really be teachers who love like people who love teach. Mm -hmm. Um, I like you can love your content and people say this of high school teachers all the time and college professors, like they don't love kids. They love their content and elementary teachers traditionally love kids, but maybe don't have the same depth of knowledge around the particular subjects that they're teaching all of them. Um, And I, I believe that to really inspire kids Like part of what gave me so much credibility in my classroom was the fact that I was doing what I was asking them to do. And I was really comfortable sharing my crappy first drafts with them and showing them the comments my editors put on things and, and even being really transparent about my reaction to those comments the first time I read them or going back through some of my old papers even Mm -hmm. and saying to them, you know, when you're a writer, you're on this journey and it's always evolving and you could be super proud and it could be the best you are right now when you look at it. But in five years from now, you're going to look at it again and you're going to have evolved from that place. And when you have that writing is not going to feel so great anymore because it's just the best of where you were at that time. And writing is one of those skills that is ever evolving your vocabulary is growing your style can shift and change and especially as young writers as you're developing your voice like having those opportunities to try on different voices until you Mm -hmm. find the one that fits that's your own and being able to share that journey with them and have them be a part of my writing journey because many of my students have been part of my books whether they've written things specifically for the books or I've used their work as evidence of the things that I was talking about. And now I've been blessed. I have like a handful of kids who are teachers Mm -hmm. because I taught the 12th grade. They come back to me as a, you know, looking for me to be a mentor to them as a new teacher. And Mm -hmm. it's like the greatest gift to see these kids evolve from teenagers into young professionals after they finish school and the fact that they still want me to be a part of their journey it's like Mm -hmm. you know how could you say there that people who can't teach if you have this ongoing opportunity to build these beautiful relationships with young people who could change the world like i don't know there's just so much joy in that well usually that's usually doesn't come from teachers (laughs) it usually comes from people that you know, don't understand that too. Right. But I think there's, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of skills and gifts and teaching that many people don't necessarily have. And that's fine because, you know, that's, that's how the world works is that we have gifts in different areas and the same we want to recognize in our kids is we recognize in different professions. Um, just like, just thinking about that progression and, and talking about, um, this is an analogy I use all the time and I'm just curious of your thoughts. Okay. So okay. you taught, you taught English, obviously you taught like writing and I don't know if it's called language arts or literacy or whatever, you know, at the level you're teaching. Okay. So I, I give this analogy because I've heard English teachers say, Oh, I gotta like, like grade like 25 essays, you know, like, like that's the worst thing ever. Right. And I've heard it and you, there, you've heard it too. Right. And you maybe yes. have said it. I definitely have okay. because it's like 150 of them, okay. not 25. Okay, right, right, right. Because like high school, you're teaching, you know, multiple classes. Okay, so this is this is what I said. Like the goal of like, you know, when we think of teaching, it should be like the band teacher. And here's the mm-hmm. analogy I give. Imagine, I shout out like Mr. Howie, my band teacher, who I know we drove crazy when I was What uh, instrument younger. do you play? Well, I play bass guitar. 
Okay, so like I was like, I'm gonna play the coolest instrument that is possible. And the bass guitar is kind of like supposed to be in the background. And mm-hmm. I had an amp and I'm like, nope. And I just crank it every time. And he was just like, you need to turn it down. Like you're, and all you'd hear is bass guitar over everything, right? <laughs> so Mr. Howie, like shout out for like just being awesome. Okay, so so anyways, like you're you're playing like the I the worst sound in the world to me is someone who can't play clarinet right like of all the instruments i like just the if you cannot play the clarinet that to me has got to be horrible and so like at the beginning if you're a band teacher trying to teach kids to play all these instruments and like imagine that kid that's horrible you're like oh this is the worst right and your job as a teacher is to get them to that point where you just sit back and you're just like just just want to listen right like you've got them to that point and that i've always said like as an you know as a someone who teaches writing like that should be the goal is that you should say like i can't wait to read this because these kids are writing things that i'm really interested in reading because a lot of times i felt that and this is like i've had this like question is that do we get kids to write so that they can write at the college level to to get grades or do we get them to write so people want to read it? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want, I want kids to be able to play music in a way where people want to listen, not about getting to the next grade. I don't know, like I've shared that analogy and you know, as someone who's taught this, like, am I like, should I not be saying that? <laughs> no, no, I, what I was smiling about is it was because of stuff like that that I started bringing mm-hmm. blogging into my classroom. Right. Like it was such a, Kids need an audience that isn't me or their teacher. They need authentic audiences, right? So as a writing teacher, especially one teaching kids who are almost in college, because I mostly taught 11th and 12th graders, like there's no reason why they shouldn't be taught to use social media mm-hmm. academically right. and and also maybe playfully. So my class part of having them blog, they, they had to do a lot of reading on their own. They were doing independent reading of books, independent reading of um, poetry. And then they were reacting on their blogs. These weren't analysis papers. These weren't things that were meant to get them to go deep. It was to get them to connect with the written word mm-hmm. and then write about that connection. And then as a community, get them to respond to each other and inspire each other to read the books and poetry that they were reading and create a life, you know, have this rich literary life in class. And their blogs were brilliant. And they weren't for grades or, you know, it was it was a, a matter like they understood that the purpose was to get them to practice writing on a mm-hmm. regular basis, because the only way you get better at writing is by writing a lot. And that means different styles of writing for different audiences, trying out different things, being critical and questioning of your classmates who are doing that as well, not criticizing what they're doing, but asking questions about why they made the assertions that they made and creating that space in the classroom where they feel comfortable saying, I either identify with that because, or I disagree because and and these are the reasons why and have that not be combative but have that be a part of the culture where we're allowed to disagree yeah and i used to say it all the time you could disagree with me too you know i i invite your disagreement please challenge 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 to uplift right like that's the point is to elevate not to right if you if you're if you're challenging in a way where someone doesn't want to write anymore then then you haven't done your job and like i've seen you know no, we, we've seen that i've seen people opposite. like try to share ideas and people like rip them apart and be, makes it makes it personal and it's like so like is that what you're going to do to my kid if they're in class like are you gonna are you gonna try to like say like hey like i have your back and i want to help you and and see it from that way there i was actually looking something up and i know this could be weird because i love that you said about because i've said like you know twitter there's like twitter there's a literacy there right yep and you know uh there's i think it's david crystal talked about like basically uh he david crystal is it maybe i I think it's i I blogs about him and i'll put the link in the in the description but he did this 
talk years ago and he talked about like kids actually read and write better than they ever have because they read and write more so like there is no time when i was growing up that i would read write and walk at the exact same time right and where people do it literally all the time now and even like understanding acronyms right so like lol lmao right you know little you know things that people and it's like funny because i know some people are like sharing acronyms i'm like you don't know what that means i don't know if you should be posting that right what those letters stand for <laughs> and i've i always okay so this is what i was looking for so there's uh so i said you know we actually have used acronyms in the past that i didn't even know were acronyms so like the one acronym that a lot of people might not know is scuba. Do you know that? Okay. Yeah, what it, something about underwater. Yeah. Okay. It, so, so, okay. The only reason, and this is what I was looking for. Submerged. It's, it's actually scuba stands for so, self-contained underwater breathing, underwater breathing apparatus. Breathing apparatus. Right. Yep. And so the only reason I know this is because of family ties. Cause it, like it was, and so I had I to like, show. right. And I had to like, <laughs> look up, let's see if I could find it. Oh, do I not have this song? Let's see if we can have it. Oh no, it's not on. I had like it loaded up. Is it? I bet we've been <laughs> it's so funny. WandaVision oh, so actually good. uses family ties for one of the episodes. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The one from the eighties is family ties. This is the, this is why I know the term self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. <laughs> Ooh, do, See, baby. Learning happens in sitcoms. Let's not discount those wonderful programs. Yeah, and that's like and like and people. So many adults actually don't know that is an acronym they've been using forever. And the and I didn't know it until Alex P. Keaton. So there you go, little <laughs> little family ties <laughs> trivia. So like as soon as you said, that, I'm like, oh, I'm I'm gonna use that story because I loved sharing my my family ties scuba story because that's how I'm like because I think it was like Skippy. If you remember family ties, you're Skippy, and they're like self contained underwater <laughs> breathing apparatus, and that's the reason I know. And I think like kids are learning literacies that people actually uh, many adults don't understand, and and sometimes they villainize them because they don't understand them, right? That's the thing too. Like when we're blocking things on on school computers, right. for example, like when we have firewalls that don't allow kids to get onto YouTube, or mm -hmm. I mean, and I I get that there's inappropriate stuff on there. I get it. Is there? And and it's <laughs> what it's everywhere. I mean, the biggest problem is when we deny them access right. in a learning environment and try to teach them how to how to use those resources, mm -hmm. what to avoid, why to avoid, more importantly, why you're avoiding them in this setting. Yep. Because, you know, even code switching and understanding what's appropriate in different places, like that's our obligation in this current climate to really teach kids to navigate those different spaces and just shutting it down before we even right. get a chance to explore it is not the way to keep them safe. Um, it creates more problems because they don't actually yeah. know how to use it appropriately. That, that is like literally the problem I think we've created is the idea that, um, so I know Lord, Lord of the Flies, right? Uh -huh. That's the okay. internet. Let's throw a bunch of kids on the island and like hopefully Piggy doesn't die. And that's literally the internet. It's like, Hey, they'll figure it out. You know, these Maybe kids, we'll just throw them up. And tries. Right. There are ugly things that right. happen. And, and I, th I think that's like, people are like, you know, I'm, I'm saying, like I've said this to people is that, you know, you're worried about bad things happening. Bad things are already happening online. Oh, yeah. It is probably because we didn't, we just said not our problem. Like, hey, parents will figure out, parents say, oh, hopefully the schools will teach it. And kids are like, let's go to the island. <laughs> let's see what we can do. <laughs> And I think, you know, a lot of kids have figured that out, but I, like I said, it's, it's really important that we guide them. And I think, you know, um, this is, like I said earlier, I've known you for such a long time and I've been, and there's a blur to it because we've actually connected in these spaces. And like, what's mm -hmm. interesting to me is that, uh, I, I know I kind of like briefly touched on this. I'm like obsessed with like basketball shoes right now. And like, I joined like a basketball shoe community and it's just really interesting and i like feel like i'm better able to like navigate that and learn from stuff and and like it's just interesting 
because of all the stuff I've done in education around this. And so I think a lot of times we, we prepare kids like we would as educators, but like that space is not on Twitter. It's on Slack, which I've never used uh, before that, but I figured out pretty quickly because, you know, I have a certain development like literacy and Mm -hmm. I can figure these things out. And so I think there's a real benefit to that because when I look at that Slack community of people that are like obsessed with basketball shoes and really feel a connection and like I'm starting to make friends and starting to do that. There's, you know, if I post on like edgy Twitter, like who wants to talk basketball shoes? People are like, what? Like, so to that end, I will share a little secret too about the community that I'm involved with that I don't talk about publicly often. Pokemon Go. (laughs) I, I wasn't. Um, I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know where you're going with that. <laughs> so I'm on a Discord with Pokemon people Go. in my community who play Pokemon Go, and the thing that's crazy about it is, my son, when he was little, was right. so into it, and I was like the cool mom for like six months because I was right. that crazy woman who would drive slowly down blocks with a car full of like pre teenage boys who smelled really badly and were <laughs> all competing right. to like get the Pokemon and we would find out on this the, is like the one on with the, the app on the phone that you're going outside. Yep. Right? Yep. So like the, you know, my, he had the cards when he was little and he was so into it. And then I was with him all the time playing on his account and he wouldn't let me play yeah. on his account anymore when we were all doing it together. So I was like, I just, I got to get my own account. <laughs> and now he's 15. Yeah. He thinks I'm, he can't believe I, I still play right. it. Like I play it and maybe, I am in Maybe he shouldn't have kicked you out. Maybe he shouldn't have kicked you out of the club. Well, I mean, because he stopped. Then it was Fortnite right. and now it's Super Smash Brothers, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And and now I'm like, I'm like at one of the highest levels and people in my little Pokemon Go community, which not so ironically is mostly adults yeah. who have kids who were in the same boat that I was in to start. And somebody, somebody said this, I thought it was pretty funny was they said, um, like last summer, like 2020 was like the op- the exact opposite of Pokemon Go summer, right? It's like one summer, everyone's going outside and doing stuff and like connecting with people. And then the other side is like, nope, we're all going to be in our houses. It was like, they just use exact, because remember, it was like such a, it's literally yeah. was the opposite last year. So Poke- but what they do now, they have adapted and now you could like battle remotely. So on the discord, we actually organize different group raids so right. that we could get these legendary Pokemon. Look at this. Look at this conversation. Just going into basketball shoes, Pokemon go. It's <laughs> <laughs> just everything. That's good. And I, I love, I love it. This is what seriously. this is. No, but this is what I love about the podcast is that I don't just like talking to education, right? Like it's good because I think, I think for too many years I follow, like I am an educator and like, that's, that's me. 360 live breathe you know and i think that's not good for anybody i don't think it's good for kids to see that and their teachers too like i think you know so i love that you are interested in that and uh yeah we should have like a pokemon go basketball i think your community. brother plays he's one of my oh friends. yeah oh yeah he, he was like super into it right so he's i never still into it we're like almost best friends on the app <laughs> well maybe you should have done the podcast with him then <laughs> you could do like a whole Pokemon Go because I like I I know of it. I didn't I didn't really get into it. So, but I was just too busy with my basketball shoe community. So, okay. So I'm trying I trying to get out of it. <laughs> you can't like once you're in that Pokemon Go community, it's like it's like Pokemon Mafia, right? Like you, yeah. So my you, husband's trying to stage an intervention. He's like, you're on your phone way too much. You gotta just stop with that I love business. It. I love it. Okay, so this is you know. I, and I feel bad maybe asking you this because I'm sure everyone talks to you about this because okay. you're really connected with really kind of going great lists, right? And mm-hmm. and I don't know if you're sick of talking about that, Never. but I know it's some okay, that's good because I know that's something yep. that um, I've really been passionate about. I haven't written about it but enough, but I know that so many people listening to this and you know are interested in the work that I do are really connected to that. So just like talk about like, where, whatever you want to talk about with that, like where did it start? Maybe like what you're doing, kind of the philosophy behind this. Sure. So 
I think I started traditionally grading like everybody mm -hmm. just based on how I, you know, what was done to me. And, right. I, and I put it like that because that's what grades are. We do them to kids. I don't really think it has very, very little to do with actual learning. It has to do with what mood I'm in when I'm sitting down to grade your paper, how much wine I drank and where <laughs> you are in the stack. Um, just I got to ask you this quick. So like... <laughs> So like more wine equals better mark or more wine. Okay. <laughs> All right. It depends. Right. Um, you know, and, and like I said, it also depends on where I am in the pile. Um, at least that's right. where it was in the beginning. Right. And and that subjectivity is especially with writing, which we have no business grading, in my opinion. Right. Like that's it's like art or dance or music. Like these are things that are personal expressions. Right. And the way we communicate is so like there are some nuts and bolts that I could certainly help with like grammar and, and syntax and, and just the way things come off as a reader. I could tell you if you're communicating what you're trying to communicate. Um, I can make suggestions and I used to say this to my kids all the time. Like I can make suggestions to you, but you have, you are the author of what you've created and therefore you make the decision as to whether or not you want to make the corrections I suggest. Um, barring, you know, barring the actual grammatical things that kind of need, that aren't being done on purpose. Okay. So I gotta, I gotta share this with you before you go on because there's two okay. things I want to share with you. First of all, I actually wrote in Innovates of the Box that about my blog and like how important it is to me. And I said, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I connected it to grading. I said, if you started grading my blog, I would want to quit writing. Hmm. Like that, th like really. And that, that to me is like, then, but then we do that to kids. So I really appreciate you said that. I got to tell you this too, because I remember this, I got a comment from an educator. They might be listening. And I hope they are, to be honest with you. Okay. So I write blogs. I like blog at least once a week. I send an email to people once a week. So I have like two pieces of writing that go out for sure every week to people. Yep. Okay. Longer forms, putting myself out there, trying different things. Right. <laughs> and so this one time I wrote, Hey, I'm just like trying to process my thoughts. So I'm not really sure. And you know, like, I'm sure you're very aware of this. Sometimes you write to learn, Everything. not write to share your learning. Like you're actually using right. that writing process to yes. actually processing your thinking. And that mm -hmm. is a really good process for me. And so I wrote, please bear with me. And I wrote B A R E. Okay. Okay. Which still to this day makes sense to me. Okay. Then someone wrote to me on an email I've never met. And they said, it's actually bear B E A R. And as soon as you said that, I had no interest in reading the rest of what you had to say. And I'm like, and I wrote back and I like said, you're an educator. Like, is this seriously what you're doing? Like, because I got one error, now everything that I have is disregarded. And like, seriously, if you did that to my kid, I'd be livid, right? Like, and, but like, hey, I actually, if people have said to me, like, they'll send me a DM, like, hey, heads up, you like uh, wrote this. I just want to give you, and like, and so kind like DM kind if they would have said like, if, if they would have said that to me, I'd have been okay with it, right? Like, hey, just so you know, like I love what you wrote. Um, just so you know, like it's actually used because like really, like bear, like it's bear with me. Like I'm a like a it does still doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, but whatever. I didn't make the rules of grammar. Some Neither of them are I. dumb, and that's one of them that's dumb. Anyways, but that's like and then I just felt like if you do that to me, you don't even know me. And then if you did it to a kid and totally got them off of writing and I'm like, and you're and like so courageous here that you're writing this into an email to me while I'm like pouring my soul out to people trying to process my learning and trying to do this publicly. But then you just kind of, you know, and so I, you know, I, and I typically don't, that really bothered me. And I, but I think it, the reason I share that story is because how easily that could be done to a kid, right? Like I had a hard time with it. I, this is like five years ago. So there's no way the person listened because they, after I wrote B-A-R-E, that was the end for me. And so, and so, um, yeah. And then, then just to think like how many great writers have we lost because of feedback that was like, so like, who cares? Abrasive. Yeah. And like, who cares? Like really was that, was my whole mess is lost because I wrote, uh, obviously i har harbor some ill feelings towards it this it sounds that way a little yeah bit, because it's like okay. who cares like i just like that this is this like 
<laughs> it was like I, I just can't imagine. You know, I'm really busy today, but I'm going to write an email because this really bothers me that so, he used the wrong version of bear. It's funny you should say that. When I was blogging on Ed Week, mm-hmm. um, I had a very similar experience that they publicly wrote a comment at the bottom saying that I was less credible as an English teacher yep. when I made spelling mistakes. And I wrote a post that said the next post was even English teachers make mistakes. Yeah. And the whole premise of it was what you just suggested. Like I'm a learner too. Totally. When I'm writing a blog post at six o'clock in the morning and it's dark, I don't always proofread. Now that I'm going against everything I tell my kids about proofreading, but the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes you miss something. Yeah. Even when you reread it, it doesn't make you illiterate. It means you made a mistake. And you know, Thank you miss you something it. if you put a lot of content out too, right? You like you're more likely, you're more likely to miss stuff if you're putting out content all the time. And I think that's yeah. what people like, like a lot of times we, we criticize when we're not putting stuff out because that, that's, that's how we see the contribution. Right. So. Well, I mean, and that, and that all goes back to the grading stuff too, though. Like, I feel like I have an opportunity um, young writers are trusting mm-hmm. me. Sometimes they have totally. bad experiences that I'm trying to undo, trying to convince them that just because they've had a bad experience or two doesn't make them any less a writer than they were to begin with. We're, we're all writers. Um, and it's just a matter of how you use your voice and what that looks like mm-hmm. and what you want to do with it. So, you know, really making sure, and, and this obviously didn't happen right away. Cause like I said, I started very traditionally. And I would have been one of those stern people in years right. one to five because I did not know any better. And then as time kind of started to evolve and my son started school and they used standards-based grading in his elementary school. And I've shared this story a lot and I shared it in my Ted talk. And like, it really made such a tremendous impact because I really knew how he was doing in his classes. And here I was putting single grades on report cards in these AP classes I was teaching and it didn't communicate anything. I was, I didn't even have the flexibility to add a narrative that was really unique to each child. It was those pre-slugged number 42, number nine, number whatever. And the more dissatisfied that I was getting with that communication of learning, the more I started experimenting. And because I was a journalism teacher also, and my class was a student lab, essentially, Mm -hmm. it was running a newspaper, um, you can't grade that. Um, And you can't teach it traditionally either because everyone in the room is doing something different all the time. And in order to make that space work, you have to empower kids to be responsible for other kids if they're section editors or the, Mm -hmm. you know, editor in chief. And it's not your show, it's their show. Your job is to make sure that they're not doing anything libelous, that you're helping them improve their writing, that once we went fully online, that they're not plagiarizing, that they're using things appropriately, Mm -hmm. and you're helping those editors develop their feedback giving skills to their peers and and whatnot, and doing it in a humane way. Um, We have a lot of power as teachers and grades are one of the weapons that we have in our arsenal. When we don't use them humanely, they can really damage students. Um, Even the ones that are high achieving are damaged by us labeling them with those with those labels, because then they don't see themselves as whole people. They see themselves in the context of having to achieve to be the person they think they are. And, and we're all just so much more than that. And that's what the latest book is about, which is basically the evolution of like starting all the way over here, kind of moving in the middle, kind of moving back again, and then thinking about the equity piece and the social emotional needs of kids and how assessment really plays into that and, and the way that we could adjust our assessment practices so that we can honor the dignity of kids by the way we assess them, by giving them voices, you know, lifting their voices up, giving mm-hmm. them choices, providing feedback, teaching them to reflect really robustly so that they could be filling those gaps of what we don't see like sharing with us their learning because no assessment we create is going to give them the opportunity to show everything that they know and coming 
at it from a real strengths-based approach. Right. You're doing this great. Let's keep building on that. Let's set some goals around these other things to support that thing. You're really doing great. And as a writer, there's plenty of things kids do great, even if they struggle with other things. So, so why I, not start there? I, I'm going to ask you more about your book in a second. Uh, and okay. cause I'm like really looking and it's, it's, it's titled assessing with respect mm -hmm. and it's coming out really soon. Like I don't have two a copy weeks. of it cause it's not out yet, but by the time yep, this podcast drops, it will be available. And I know it's going to be really helpful, but I just want to share a couple of things uh, before I ask you more about the book. So first okay. of all, I remember having a conversation with, you know, it's like saying like your grades are not scientific, right? Like a lot of people right. think like, cause you said that about, you know, like, Hey, like, you know, you got like 75 or 3.6, I don't know, whatever. Okay. And so I'll give you an example. So I give an example that seems to be like, no, that is the exact thing. Right? So like, what about spelling tests? Right? You got 10 words. Kid gets one wrong, so they got nine out of ten. Okay. Test. Well, that's like I, okay. So that this is that could be a whole podcast. So I'm not. I'm actually not against spelling tests. I, I don't. I'm not against times tables. I'm not against spelling tests and things like that. But I think that you know, like I think you know, spelling is is important, right? And I think you know, there's ways you can learn and things like that. But the the point of it with the assessment is that you, yeah, okay, yeah, it's nine out of ten. You know, you got ninety percent. But like, how much are you weighting a spelling test out of the overall mark? Right. So there's that thing too. There's that element. And, and it's kind of like the infall the infallibility of, and I know people listening to this, um, you know, they, they totally agree with your philosophy and they agree. And I'm, and this is, I'm going to ask you about this with assessing with respect is that some people still have to do grades. Like they, they would like to not do that, mm -hmm. but they, they don't have that opportunity because their school, their district says they got to do this. Right. So like to understand you're not perfect in the way that you grade and they're not perfect in the way that you weight stuff and things like that. So right. like the, the notion that you're doing like everything that you said, like, Hey, the kid got 79.8. And it's like, like, did they like, really like exactly like, and I would tell my teachers, like, I don't, I'm not looking through your grade books. I'm not looking to like say that, well, I found a percentage off here. Like you, you make a judgment call because we still have to do grades things like that. And this is, you said something too, and it reminded me. So, uh, just cause just kind of going away from like writing and English and things like that. Right. And why this is so important. So when I was a kid, kindergarten, grade eight, this is elementary school for me, right? Like kindergarten, grade eight is elementary where I lived nine to 12 is high school. There's no middle school, junior high, anything like that. So kindergarten, grade eight, I'm like the top math student in my class, like every single year, I'm like one or two, which, you know, like I was pretty proud of, I'm not going to lie. Okay. So like, you know, and grades were, grades were a big thing for me and I understand that. Right. They were for me too. So, so then, then I hit grade nine and all of a sudden I'm like failing. And I'm like, what happened that I'm literally one of the top math students. And then when I go to math in high school, like it wasn't like I was, you know, doing something like socially that was pulling me out of school or anything like that. Like I was attending my classes, things like that. I just don't understand. So what really happened was kindergarten grade eight, uh, numeracy is like 95% of what you do in elementary school at the time, right? Like it's like basic math skills, like multiplying. And then mm -hmm. just a little tiny portion at that level is kind of starting to getting into like, you know, lower algebra. level algebra, geometry, things like mm -hmm. that. And that's where the area struggled. So I could literally get like a hundred percent on, on that part and get and fail the other part and still be one of the top students. Right. And so my parents and I every year would look, well, I'm awesome at math. I'm just the best, right? There you go. There's the grade. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like, and so really when I look back on it, what I started to realize is that basically it was never identified that I struggled with these things because it was just, here's the grade, here's the grade. Right. right? And mm -hmm. so sometimes even when, and then, and then I start struggling in math because it's never identified. This is what I have an issue with. Then I totally check out, do terrible in math, basically from grade nine on. And I had to take like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, calculus cause I want to be a kindergarten teacher, you know, obviously that makes sense. You got to take calculus. And so, and I did, and I like, I remember I got 40% in calculus class, um, in, uh, in, in elementary education, but, and so I failed it. So I shouldn't have graduated, but like literally everybody failed. So they, they curved the mark 20%. So I got a 60, I can still remember the exact mark. Right. 
And, and that, and so like that method is like when you're talking about like identifying and actually having conversations and, and, and talking about that, it's actually of service to the student. It's a service to the next grade teacher as well, yeah. because I think it's really easy to get caught up in that. And so in your book, Assessing with Respect, right? And you talked a little bit about it. Um, what's, can I ask you, what's the subtitle? Do you remember? I know, it like, is. I always, like, I, oh, you got to pull it up. I get, like, I can't remember. I do. I'm so bad. It's something like. Um, <laughs> did you write, did you write it? Did you write I it? Did. Yeah, I right. did. I have it on my screen. Hold on a sec. You know, it's so long. Like, I know all the words. I just don't know the right order. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> so it's so, like, um, do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm singing about it. It's no, course, okay. I don't even want to know anymore. I want to actually it's everyday what? practices <laughs> that that meet students' social and emotional needs. Just say shout out for getting your own subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, that's so, how not pretentious I am about these kinds of things when people ask. Okay, so I want you to do so. One, I got a couple questions on it. One minute okay. overview of the book. You got one minute. One minute. One so minute. I want the one minute overview. I don't know why I gave you that parameter. I just did. I'm going to probably do it. do it in less than a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, it's basically what teachers can practically do every single day when they're making choices about assessment to honor the dignity of the kids in their classes mm -hmm. from building, building relationships, um, reflecting co-constructing success criteria if they're the right age co-constructing curriculum uh it talks about equity uh, it talks about um our privilege that we kind of have to work through it talks about understanding the emotional needs so it talks about student learner identity and every subgroup is kind of identified and worked through as well so your lg your lgbtq community your l's your black and brown students mm -hmm. um, and really tries to talk to the equity of the way we speak to grading and making sure students get their needs met. So when you, when you say that, when you use the terminology co-constructing curriculum, right? And you mm -hmm. utilize that. I think that when we, when students, and I don't know if the, um, I'm interpreting this right. And that's why I'm asking you is just to kind of further explain what that means really kind of having students be a part of that space where they see themselves represented. Right. And I've talked about that. Yep. We ta I can't remember if we talked about this in the last podcast or the, or this one right now, but for me, uh, like I didn't really connect with what I was reading and I hated reading when I walked out of school because I didn't actually Makes see sense. myself in that space. Right. Cause we always right. read, like I, I knew and our, our like English teacher in high school, I loved him. He was a great, he was a great man. I knew in grade three, that I was reading the great Gatsby in grade 11 because I had two older brothers and they actually would right. do an impression of the teacher going daisy, daisy, daisy. Like I remember that impression. I just remember <laughs> it. And so I knew this, like great Gatsby's coming up in grade 11. Right. So like, there's no, um, modification to the kids in the class. And like, you know, and I understand that. And like, I, I don't ever look down on any teacher doing something because like, they didn't like, they didn't have the internet. Like really, I know this is a weird thing. They knew what they knew in, in that place. We have access to all the information. We have access to yep. all the resources. And literally they were our, like the school was our internet, if that makes sense. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you talk the about library. the library, when you, when you talk about the idea of uh, co-constructing curriculum, like what does that look like right now? Like, give me like an example of what sure. that could look like. I definitely can. Yeah. So the first time I let go of control enough in my 12th grade AP lit class, I used to teach Hamlet a certain way mm -hmm. almost every single year, right? There were certain objectives that had to be met. I might have varied some of the projects that went through, but there was, there was a time frame. There was an overarching idea that I was trying to accomplish. And usually after Hamlet, we went right into Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And then the kids wrote a one act play and blah, blah, blah. Right. So when we were doing Hamlet, one of my last years at that school, I actually gave out on every single desk copies of my lesson plans for the entire unit, the projects, everything. And I said to them in small groups, these are the objectives we need to meet for this for this lesson, you know, for this unit, 
um, Hamlet's a pretty relatable character to kids their age because mm -hmm. he essentially that angsty sort of thing <laughs> going back to that. Yeah. Um, he is. He's like dark and brooding and, you know, there are ways to connect with him. And so I said to them, you have two choices in your group. You could come up with a project or you could default to what we've done before. And then as a class, we'll vote to see which one we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And then if we decide on one of the projects that the kids decided on, you'll come up at lunch one day and we'll eat together and we'll design the project together, timeline and all. And you will help me construct success criteria. What is this going to look like? Benchmark ideas, blah. Needless to say, these four brilliant young ladies came up with the most amazing project mm -hmm. I think I've ever done as a teacher, where what they decided was they were going to psychoanalyze a character from Hamlet. And the project was broken up into like five parts where they first had to mine the text to find out, you know, do good characterization of what Shakespeare said about this character. And then they had to do research on um, psychosis related to the characterization. And then they had to come up with a solution for the psychosis and create a movie. So there was like storyboarding, script writing, um, and then actually creating a movie that diagnoses this character and helps them get the treatment that they need. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we were going to screen those movies because everybody was doing a different character and provide feedback about what they learned about the character and how close it was to the text itself. So that's how I was covering the full text in that way, instead of, you know, sitting in a circle and right. reading act by act by act. The, the work the students created, first of all, I would have never come up with that on my own. No. Like I'm smart, but that was smarter than anything I could have come up with. And so much, it had so much more depth and that group of kids was really into psychology. So it was like this right. nice overlap of what they were super interested in and also this really deep way of looking at the text. So I totally released control over it. And what they came up with was so much better than what I came up with. And bonus, they loved watching the movies right. at the end. They had these crazy projects that they created and produced, essentially, all of them produced those movies. And we shared them. And it was amazing. So when I talk co-construction, I'm like, legit, here's what we have. Tell me what you got. What do you want to do? Let's make this happen. Yeah. And like, I know that you say that kids are smarter than you, but like, obviously they just, I just think they have different ideas, right? Like, yep. and they, you know, another teacher, when you're like thinking about this process would be like, oh, I would have never thought of that too. And I think that's when we tap into our communities and this includes our students, then we're better off because we have access to different ideas. Like I never want um, you know, I, I used to say this to my staff all the time. This is not about your idea. This is not about my idea. It's about the best idea. And that it doesn't matter where that comes from. And I think that totally. we have to utilize that with our students. So you have like, uh, okay, so somebody's listening to this right now and they're going, sorry, this is, this is great, but okay. Like I, my school is not gonna let me do something like that. Like, mm. and this is, this is one of the, the, I don't, I like, I always struggle with this question. Like, Hey, we're like scripted, right? So I would like to try some of the stuff, which I feel like basically one of the really important facets of education is that, you know, you're, you're also, there's an artistry to how you deliver curriculum. Right. 100%. And then when you, yep. when you take that artistry away, it really kind of sucks the life out of some people too. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and part of it, like there's an artistry, there's that human connection, there's, there's all these different facets. So to the, to the educator that's listening to this right now and saying like, so what do I, what do they do when they're having a lot more structure ways that they have to teach based on what their school, their district, their administrators are saying, what, what advice would you give to them? Okay. So this is, a, there's a lot going on there. And I will say this, first of all, you know how teachers bear, say, you bear know, with, I'm going to bear with you. Please B E A R. Do. Um, or you could bear yourself. <laughs> no, no. Um, with okay, your, that um, that actually helped me understand why you don't say the other one. Okay, that <laughs> okay now it makes sense. <laughs> okay, that that you helps. Know, okay, saucy, good. a little different than where you thought you might go with that, but yeah, that's good. You know, um, the, my superpower as an educator is finding and exploiting loopholes. Mm -hmm. Now, we're all really smart people. Like, I mean, part of the reason we do what we do is because mm -hmm. we know stuff, right? So there is always a way 
around to circumvent the things that have to be done, even within the structure that mm -hmm. you have. It's just finding which parts you could tweak without destroying a structure. It's, it's taking the risk. There, there are two things administrators are never going to be able to deny, right? If you get results, yep. they can't say no. That's, that's, and, and I was very big on um, asking forgiveness and not permission once I had tenure. And, mm -hmm. and the part of that is because it takes, it takes a lot of guts to try something that's really outside the norm. And you know this, mm -hmm. right? So when you take that risk and you get the results that you're hoping you're going to get, and you have that evidence to support right. the impact of your decision, no educator, and, and this was the rub with my own administration at that time, because they were using, um, scripted curricula mm -hmm. in various different places. And I rejected it. Like just, I can't teach a scripted curricula no. because it doesn't, it doesn't go with my overall philosophy with what I'm doing. And I was largely left alone after a while because I was getting results and my classroom would end up being the classroom because I'm um, in New York City. They use the Danielson framework and right. to be highly effective with Danielson, it's all about student centered learning, right? Mm -hmm. Students are in control of questioning. Students are the ones leading direction um, mm -hmm. discussions. Students, students are the ones leading, right? Well, how could students lead if we're using scripted right. curricula? Teachers right. can't even lead in that right. scenario. So, you know, what I would say is take the risk, have the results, and then approach after the fact. If people walk by your door, have the script open on your desk. You can deviate from those things so long as the objectives that were clearly shared with kids um, are being taught as far. And, and when I was a leader, I would have encouraged my student, my teachers to do the same thing. You got to be with your kids, mm -hmm. be with them in the learning be with them with the pacing that and that's why you know project-based learning is really the most flexible way to help mm -hmm. kids get what they need and have a lot of voice and choice in the process of what's going on so here's something that is did that even to, answer your question it, it totally did and i'm gonna just maybe expand on a little bit too and just thinking okay. about like circumventing right so mm -hmm. in every school they're going to say like things like, Hey, we want our kids to be risk takers. We want them to like Ooh. develop resiliency. We want to be creative and things like that. But you got to teach, you got to teach script. Right. And so I think part of it too, is that as educators, I think the question that you have to ask of administrators is like, are you giving us the same freedoms? Are you trying to develop the same things in us that we're trying to develop in students? Because if you don't allow us to be those things ourselves, we can't model it for kids, right? If you expect kids to be creative, if, if you expect kids to develop resiliency, but you tell us exactly how we have to teach, then you're not actually, you're not actually asking, you're not actually giving us the space to do. And then, and then it's like a trickle down effect, right? Like we often what about modeling. Yeah, right? totally, totally right. You, you, you like, can't if you, model if you can't do it. Hundred percent, and I think that that to me is you know really kind of as I'm listening to you and thinking about that, it is like, hey, we want kids to be this, but we're going to tell you exactly how to get there and how to be in that space, right? And I think you know I, I'm a, I'm a big believer that I I don't believe it. Good and men leave teachers alone. I don't. I think good and men like support their teachers, give them some guidance, give them some conversation, help them to grow, but they give them like, but if I like, for example, if I ask you to, to do those things, I have to feel some comfort level to, to like, you know, I hired you. So I trust you to do those things. If I didn't trust you, then don't hire the person. Right. And I, I think that's, that's part of it too. So I, I'm really looking forward to the book and I know. And so again, it's assessing with respect subtitle mm -hmm. is a mystery <laughs> but it but everyday really it's the title everyday practices that meet the social and emotional <laughs> students social and emotional needs right i almost got it on the third try <laughs> okay so i gotta i gotta ask you one one personal question and i really appreciate okay. your time with me okay so <laughs> you've written 10 books okay mm -hmm. i've read seven in my life total of all books i'm just kidding it's probably like nine <laughs> 
you're like oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna like, like one day i'm gonna read as many my goal is to read as many books as you've written okay so so with that all being said um if you were to write a book in outside of education mm -hmm. what would that book be about does it count if is i it, already did <laughs> no i i was i knew you're gonna say that i knew you're gonna say that i was like i i was gonna just, so no it doesn't i don't you can, but you i can't mean that. honestly that book is like what is it little known secret it is it, it about pokemon go <laughs> no 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 it's a historical fiction book that started as a project i did with my students in far rockaway really? like I, we were they were writing um historical fiction stories so i was writing with them yeah and I had written a short story and they loved the short story. They're like, Miss Saxon, you need to finish that. And that's awesome. you know, I'm not a fiction writer though. Like what I learned from that experience, I, I tried. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is not my forte. Um, long fiction, I like to read it. I enjoy it. Um, I really appreciate now people who do it well, but um, I could do, like witty satirical short stories maybe um because i i you know fancy myself a wit of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> okay so do you know um, when you were talking when you're talking about before about writing and you said about like writing and music okay do you know the movie almost famous you have to know this movie love it one of my favorites of course cameron crowe's like genius he is genius and uh he did what jerry Maguire, almost famous vanilla sky Jerry Maguire is like, that's like a legit one of my favorite movies ever. I, well, I can, it's honestly almost famous. It's funny you should bring it up as one of my all time favorite movies. Well, when you said that, I, I really connected with it. Like I, like I watch it again. Uh, like I, it always kind of pops up and I'm like, eh, and then I watch it. And I was like, oh, I'm, uh, this movie's so good. Because it's journalism and it's music mm -hmm. and it's like finding yourself. And and that actually is based on Cram and Crow. Like, isn't that him? Yep. Like the, the young guy going on the. Tour. Yep, and then he's got like the curmudgeon old journalist telling yep. him Philip you should Seymour never Hoffman. get in with the band. And you know, once you're in bed with the band, you can't be objective <laughs> about what's going on. And you know, even just the sense of illusions as he's kind mm -hmm. of lifted the curtain of what's going on. There's so many beautiful when when I teach um interviewing in my journalism classes, I always showed scenes from that movie when he was doing different right. interview parts just so good it's really rich that's like there. i know this is like crazy and i'm a big music person that was the first time i've ever heard the song tiny dancer was that movie really yeah and oh. i like that was like and i can't I was like, this is a really great song dancer now without thinking about totally them on the bus because yeah and you know kate hudson kind of doing her little thing at the end she, uh, that's a great movie that's a great okay so like yeah so anyone anyone like who's that. listening like that is a great movie, Vanilla Sky. Vanilla Sky. Did you ever see Vanilla Sky? Yes, I have. It's good. Weird. It's good Weird, though. I like good. it. You know, when we are cats. That's one of my favorite lines ever. Yeah. So hey, I just want to start. Thanks for um, taking time to be on the podcast, <laughs> share ideas. Thanks for uh, finally explaining to me why you shouldn't use bear, b a r e, to say bear with me. Now I understand. And I thank you for kind of walking me through that process. But yeah, like I really appreciate um, just having a conversation with you and I, like just knowing how much you've inspired in other people to try new things. And it's really great to hear about your practices with, you know, students and getting them excited about writing and um, how you do that. So everybody, uh, if you check out, you're going to see the link to the book. It's going to be out in what, April? March 23rd. March 23rd. Okay. So yep. March 23rd. So uh, this podcast is going to be posted after this. So it is available. Check it out. And Star, thanks for your time. And I hope everyone thanks listening so has much, a wonderful George. day. Okay. Bye, everybody.